It's a Woman Crush Wednesday. Join Professor Buzzkill as he crushes on women from history who deserve more fame and glory. Yes, indeedy. It's a Woman Crush Wednesday here at the Buzzkill Institute. And also here at the Buzzkill Institute is one of our favorite 20th century international relations professors. And that is, of course, Professor Nash. How are you, sir? Howdy, howdy, howdy. And today we're going to look at... Maria Bachkarova. Maria Bachkarova. I think I can guess from roughly what part of the world she's from originally. <laughs> Correct. She's from Thailand. Absolutely. <laughs> we don't have very many Thai women crush Wednesdays. We should have more. No, well, I also thought it was important to start doing a more non-American crushes. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Right? Even, even though I'm an Americanist. Because there, there's the whole world out there. But yeah. Maria Bachkarova is pretty interesting. Yeah, and we have a large uh, listenership in, in Russia, by the way. There you go. Yeah. All right. So here we go. A little shout out. Yeah. In, in English, anyway. So, uh, born a born to a peasant family in Siberia, in Tomsk, I believe, mm-hmm, 1889. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Her father had fought in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 78. And no, we're not going to do a podcast on that. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you if you want to see your listenership go down, yeah, let's yeah, that one let's, would be uh, obs- <laughs> obscure War Friday. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, her father was uh, an alcoholic who apparently beat on everybody in the family. Uh, she got married at 15 and her marriage failed. Her husband was also a violent alcoholic. Oh, uh, two in a row. She and, and it turns out it's three in a row because she is in a second such relationship when World War I breaks out. And um, we don't know for sure, but it's possible one of the reasons she tried to enlist in the Russian army when World War I break out is that she wants to get out of this marriage. Uh, That's a possibility. Okay. That's a okay. possibility. Okay. So she tried to enlist in the Russian army. She was not unique. There were other women who tried to do this in other armies as well. Uh In her memoir that she dictated after the war, she said, and I quote, My heart yearned to be there in the boiling cauldron of war, to be baptized in its fire and scorched in its lava. Oh, that's pretty clear. Pretty dramatic. Yeah, a little hardcore. Uh, She said, The spirit of sacrifice took possession of me. My country called me. So she, I mean, there is no doubting her patriotism and her patriotic fervor. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, like yeah. a lot of men and women. How did how did her family react to this? Uh, her family was not really pleased. Uh, she has some <laughs> rather she has some rather colorful accounts in her memoir about her mother's opposition. Apparently, her mother, when her mother found out that she had enlisted, she uh, took the portrait of Tsar Nicholas II that was on the wall, yeah. tore it to pieces. Ouch. We don't know if that actually happened. By the way, there are some historians who question aspects of her autobiography. Like a lot of autobiographies, it may not be 100% reliable. Just wait till mine comes out. Exactly. That's going to be full of fictions. And so she tried to enlist, uh, and she was ridiculed by the army people she came in contact with, mm-hmm, perhaps mm-hmm. not surprisingly. Then she does, she does not give up. She sends a telegram to the Tsar himself, Oh, and he reads it and intervenes on her behalf. Now, presumably, he's... Pretty busy, but you would, somehow this you would got through. Think, you somehow would think. I, yeah, this okay. does make him look like a micromanager. There's no, <laughs> there's no question. But he was impressed, and so he basically said, "No, admit her." So she cut huh. her, cut her hair really short and joined the army. Uh, went through basic training. Yeah. She was ridiculed some more. She was yeah, not welcomed into the military, right? Yeah. Especially if you like, you don't believe women belong in the military, and then the brass intervene. Exactly, you're not yeah. going to be really happy about that. She was literally harassed. Uh, mm-hmm. She, in, by her account, uh, when her first nights in the barracks with the men, she basically had to spend the entire night, entire night fighting off attempted rapes. Oh, God. But gradually she wins over the men in her uniform. I get the impression that the, she won them over, but it's kind of like a paternalistic thing. Like they sort of take her as a mascot in uh, a way and like, yeah. be like become, in other words, they don't admit her as an equal. Yeah. They sort of, you know, they take to her, obviously, they start calling her Yashka. That becomes her, her, her nickname. Uh, but I, yeah, I think they're sort of like viewer as sort of the, the, the regimental mascot or whatever. Uh, she clearly liked military life and took to it. Mm-hmm, she mm-hmm. obviously, she put up with the physical rigors. Uh, she discovered that she was a pretty good shot with the rifle. Right. And then when she's in combat, she's quite clearly a brave soldier. She, on more than one occasion, rescued wounded people from no man's land. You know, that sort of fought oh, over yeah. area between the two opposing forces. 
she which was, is always very dangerous, even if you're just rescuing. Absolutely. Yeah. This is not for the faint of heart. She was wounded and decorated multiple times and became quite famous. Yeah, okay. In 1917, under the Kerensky government. Yeah, Alexander right? Kerensky, if right. people remember from the Russian uh, Russian Revolution show, there is this... Uh, yes, that's right. The Tsar, the Tsar is overthrown in early 1917. Then for most of 1917, there's this uh, liberal government under Alexander Kerensky. Some of our buzzkillers might remember all this sort of period... From better from the movie Doctor Zhivago, but go ahead. <laughs> maybe may uh, uh, the war is going poorly, and one as I think I mentioned before, uh, Kerensky's one of his big mistake is staying in the war. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, during this period, an all female strike force is formed. We don't know for sure whether it was her idea. Uh huh. She certainly supported it. <laughs> she was a big fan of I creating mean, strike force, actual sort of yeah, an actual combat unit, an, wow. a, a combat unit that was consisted only of of women. Now it's also pretty clear that the purpose or a large part of the purpose behind this was propaganda. Uh-huh. Sure, sure. Uh, in other words, you inspire and maybe even shame male soldiers by having an all-female unit. Oh, like, okay. In other words, if, okay. They, look, okay. if they're fighting bravely, why can't you? Gotcha. You gotcha. know, I'm, yeah. I'm reminded of this, I use this in class, this famous American uh, Navy recruiting poster, which has a woman dressed up in a man's Navy uniform, and mm-hmm. it says, gee, I wish I were a man. Yeah, that's right. It's the yeah. same basic idea. In yeah. other words, this is not about women in the military. This is about shaming men into joining the military. There was a lot of that in, in propaganda. Especially with the war going poorly. And I know the, the famous, although possibly mythological, image of, of Russian soldiers having to be sent to the front without rifles because right. there's nothing there's yeah, not yeah, enough yeah, yeah. munitions and stuff exactly yeah, okay. Okay. right and you saw that in World War II uh, it may be even more uh, right. but basically 2,000 women volunteer for what was called and I'm quoting the first Russian women's battalion of death the bata- first one the battalion of death I mean, it sounds like professional wrestling but, it, but it's <laughs> but it's the women's battalion of death Oh, I, I, when I first saw that, I'm like, that that's not really what it was called, right? <laughs> it must no, be that's translation. That, that's really what it was called. The first Russian wow. women's battalion. By the way, and there were other, before I forget, there were after this other women's combat units mm-hmm. formed. In fact, there was one women's uh, unit that was involved in defending the Winter Palace during the Bolshevik Revolution. Oh, okay, okay, right? okay. So this is not unique, but it's the first, it's the most prominent. Uh, Buch- uh, Bachkarova is put in command of it. She's promoted to lieutenant at one point. Mm-hmm. She, uh, 2,000 women volunteered, but a lot of them weren't soldier material, shall we say, especially oh, okay. not under her leadership. She was clearly a hard customer. Oh, okay. And it was, she basically whittled it down to 300 people. So it's a 300, 300, 300 from 2,000? Yeah, from 2,000 to 300. Oh, you know, and you've seen this in other goodness. cases. The, the, yeah, rough, sure. the Rough Riders sure. did a similar thing in 1898. And right, that was where part you, of their sort of Right, right and then you're you handpicked, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, even those 300 were not necessarily the most disciplined lot, but she was a very, very tough commanding officer. And I think one of the, uh, what I read is what s- some of the women under her objected to is that she basically wanted to turn them into men. Oh. Literally. In other words, oh. she, she shaved their heads no toothbrushes. She wanted them to ask, ma- act masculine in a masculine f- form. Uh, in other words, she yeah, did her yeah, best. Yeah, to like, yeah, yeah. They, you should all be like men. So this unit took part in the Kerensky summer offensive of 1917, which was a miserable failure. Mm. They mm. did fight in one battle and apparently did rather well. Okay. So okay. That's, that's, that's something. The unit was disbanded in late 1917 by the Bolsheviks. All right. And... Uh, Pretty quickly, she established connections with the so-called white forces in the Russian Civil War. These are the okay. an, these are the anti-Bolshevik right, forces right. who wage civil war against the Bolsheviks. Right. This goes on for years. Yeah, she was uh, detained and threatened with execution more than once ah. in this period. And then in 1918, she escapes to the United States via the. Via Siberia, via Vladivostok, actually. Holy cow! So must, that, that alone must be very yeah. Hard that to do. Wouldn't, wouldn't have been easy. And uh, I have to add this: when she's in the United States, she was hosted by the socialite and future female ambassador Florence Harriman. Florence oh. Harriman uh, is one of yeah. the. She was a U.S. minister to Norway uh-huh. in the late 1930s. Yeah. And she gets a chapter in my forthcoming book. Ah, that's little, right. If, if I can insert that little pop-up ad right yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So anyway, Florence Harriman at the time was a was a prominent uh, New York City socialite, and so she hosts uh, Bachkarova when she comes to the United States. And presuming you need a host, not only yeah, get through especially but especially also... to open doors for you. Right, for exactly. example, she gets an audience in the White House with uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson. I should tell the buzzkillers here that <laughs> that Professor Nash has put on. This is an inside joke. He's put on really his inside. outline here that that 
uh, Maria meets the Woodman in DC. Not, yes. not President Wilson. It's, it's, the Woodman. it's so boring to call him Woodrow Wilson, so I call him the Woodman. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it basically impresses him with her emotional appeal to intervene in Russia. And this is not causation. In other words, this is not the reason he did. But the United States did send oh. troops to Russia in 1918. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, alongside okay. the British and alongside the Japanese. Uh, and, and were partly a sort of anti-Bolshevik in their orientation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So while in the United States, she dictates her memoirs in English. In, in English. She's not very old. Since she's no, still no, 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 no. Mem- no oh, she's okay. what? Okay. She's not even 30 years old. Wow. And so she uh, also travels, then travels to the Great Britain and meets with King George V. Okay. So she's sort of wine and dine. She's, I mean, she's, oh, a, pretty, absolutely. she's a pretty she's famous figure. She's definitely making it through the, the, the upper echelons. Right. Of, uh, then she returns to Russia in August 1918. This turns out to be her big mistake. She uh, tries to form another unit and fails. She joins the White Forces in April 1919 again, in, in the Siberia. White Forces in the, in the Russian Civil War. That's right. These are A lot of these are czarists. A lot of these mm-hmm, are former mm-hmm. czarist um, generals and admirals, etc. And a lot of people who are anti-Bolshevik for one reason or another. She joins them, tries to form a women's medical unit, at which time she's then captured by the Bolsheviks for what it turns out is the last time. Against Lenin's orders, she is executed by the Cheka in May 1920. The oh. Cheka is the uh, these are um, Lenin's secret police. Yeah, yeah. These are these really, really brutal secret police. She was executed as quote an enemy of the working class, which is typically what they did. Is any, sure, anyone, sure. anyone who sort yeah. of got sideways with Catch the Bolsheviks, all. yeah, were basically declared enemies of the workers and, and executed. So she was executed, but this was against Lenin's orders, and I was interested to learn that she was later exonerated and pardoned by Lenin. Oh. For whatever reason, he felt really bad that they had executed her. Hmm. In fact, he felt so bad Hmm. that he had the executioners executed for oh, disobeying well, orders. That's a very Leninist <laughs> thing to do. Right, this is, this is like Stalin's purges. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we're going to purge, the, purge the purgers now. And then in 2018, not a typo, in 2018, she 2018. got her New York Times obituary. This, this was probably part of that Overlooked yes, series. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, They've got this ongoing series, series of, yeah. of sort of, um, I want to say pos- posthumous obituaries, but they're all, yeah. they're all posthumous, <laughs> aren't they? But long after the fact. Right, right. People sort of, who, who should have had yeah, them. Yeah, people who should have got them. And so she got one, and, and people can find that online. It's, it's pretty informative. I rely on it here as well. So she was the, just, uh, just so to make it clear, Bachkarova was the first Russian woman to command a military unit. Ah, uh, and and fairly she, early on, you know, very considering. early on, yeah. yes. I mean, populations, including women, were mobilized much more thoroughly for World War II mm-hmm, than during mm-hmm, World War mm-hmm, One. Mm-hmm. And nevertheless, she really deserves to be part of the sort of rich history of women in the military, and yeah. in, not just in military, but in combat. Yeah, and that's right. And in that's Russia, right. and especially the Soviet Union, the Red Army during World War II, they made much heavier use of women in combat than pretty much anybody else. And so she's part of that sort of heritage. And so I think she deserves recognition on that basis. Yes, and that's what the Woman Crush Wednesdays are for, to, to highlight women who deserve more fame and glory. Absolutely. And fame and glory was often what she was fighting for. So we'll talk to you next week, Buzzkillers. Killers.